Well, hello, Rock Church. How's everybody doing? You guys good today? Good. It's good to see you. I'm so glad that you guys are with us. It's exciting stuff. Um, as we're getting started, let me, let me celebrate. Some of you got to meet Josh at the beginning. Uh, he is our South Strand campus pastor, and we're fired up about what God is going to be doing uh, at the South End, already doing there, but especially as we go uh, to weekly services starting in two weeks. So we're excited about that, because when we do things like that, God moves. Um, I just got noticed today, for the first time ever, Aner had over over 600 in their morning worship services, all right? So, so incredible what God is doing um, at all of our campuses. So, so thankful that that's happening. If you're new with us, maybe that's here, watching online, maybe watching on demand later, uh, man, I'm, I'm glad you're with us. And uh, if you're in Conway, I want to encourage you, make sure you get connected. Uh, stop by a connect wall, uh, just right out in the lobby, a new here tent. They would love to connect with you and, and just let you know a little bit more about church. And, and we really believe that's how you truly find what matters, is that you connect with others and you connect with Jesus, all right? So uh, if you're here, do that. If you're online, uh, make sure you connect with a host, or if you're on demand later, uh, then connect to us uh, through the website, all right? Um, now, we've been in this series that, that we've called Better, and the whole idea about better is you get better by doing what is best. And, and we've talked about that uh, specifically inside the family realm. We've been talking about marriage and about family. But I think everybody will see that how it applies in other areas as well. Um, one of the things we've said is, is that we encourage people to serve the Lord, do what is better by doing what is best. And what is best is serving the Lord. So uh, we encourage you to maybe use the big rock over there at our Conway campus and write your name on it saying, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to serve the Lord. Last week we said uh, get better by, by doing what is best and remembering the blessing of God. And we encourage those of you who are married or engaged uh, to go out on a date. Uh, I've got a lot of reports from a bunch of different people who have done that. And they said it's been great and the conversations that came out of it. Uh, so if you picked up a packet last week and haven't done it yet, then do that. If, if you're wanting to pick up a date night packet, they're out in the lobby. You can pick them up there um, right at the connect wall, right? Now today, or let me say this, next week, we're going to say get better by doing what is best by discerning God's will. Uh, we're going to look at a story from the book of Joshua that is all about discerning God's will. With that, we're offering a family workshop. Uh, so for parents, grandparents, guardians, father-like, mother-like figures, we want to help you help your kids or teenagers discern God's will when it comes to technology and social media. Uh, so if you're a parent or parent-like person, then you can sign up for that workshop, and it's to help you help your kids and teenagers, those you love, all right? Today... Well, today, let me start by just saying it this way, that, that my guess is that there are some of you, maybe not everybody in this room who's like me, all right, but my guess is there are some of you who are in the room who you might admit that, yeah, I'm a little like you in this area, Josh, all right, and, and if you are, I'm just going to have you raise your hand, if you have ever made a mess of a relationship, an engagement, your marriage, or a situation in your family. If you've ever made a mess of a situation like that, just raise your hand. Is anybody with me? Yeah, that, that's what I thought, all right? That, that's what I thought. Andrew, you didn't raise your hand. And I know your wife's going to say yes, all right? Your daughter will probably say yes as well, right? You know what I'm saying? But, but we've all done it. We've all made messes. We've all screwed up. We've, we've all made some mistakes. Uh, I will say this. That the greatest mess, probably the greatest mess I ever made was when Krista and I were dating, and it was over this, a peach feather pin. Now, for those of you who are a little bit more my age, you know that weddings back then all had a feather pin at the guest registry, right? Like some of you are my age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, well, we needed a feather pin. 
that, that my wife and I, we pretty much had to pay for our wedding, that we pretty much took care of it all. Um, so, so we had nickeled and dimed everything, and it came down to we had everything except for the peach feather pin. And I knew that our wedding colors were forest green and peach, and we weren't looking for a forest green p- feather pin. We were looking for a peach one. And it was the only thing left to get. So, so one day, Chris and I were at a mall, and we're walking through a mall in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we walked into a store, and I went, and I kind of started looking, and there on the bottom shelf, it was like it was going, I mean, it was staring at me. And I was like, Chris, the baby, baby, come over here, come on. And she came over. I said, look, it's the peach feather pin we've been looking for. Let's get it. She said, I don't want that one. <laughs> what, what do you mean you don't want this one? Like, it's the feather pin. Like, I'm doing a happy dance because I finally get to contribute something to the wedding plans. And I'm like, it's everything we've been wanting. Let's buy it. And she said, no. And I got mad. What do you mean, no? I'm finally helping. I, it's my wedding, too. Not the best thing to say. <laughs> To that, she turned around, she started walking out, I walked out, she went one way, I went the other way, and I started walking, and I was mad. And I'm just like, that's it. It's over. We're done. Like, I'm ending it all off a feather pin, okay? And like, literally, mentally, to the point, I said, that's it. I turned around, started walking in her direction, because I thought the minute I find her, I'm going to get her, I'm going to put her in the car, I'm going to drive her home, and I'll never talk to her again for the rest of my life. That's literally what I thought. Fortunately, by the grace of God, it took me a while to find her. So finally, by the time I found her, I had calmed down. But she hadn't. <laughs> now, obviously, we, we, we figured it out. We patched it up. I still don't know if that's the original feather pin that I saw in the store. My guess is it's not. <laughs> My guess is she found one on her own. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but I made a mess that day over a feather pin. And we can laugh at it today, right? We've all done some things like that, like something stupid that created an argument, and you're like, why are we even arguing? Like, it happens. That's not a big deal. Where it's a big deal is when that mistake, that mess, comes because, well, what we said was a sin. What we said to that spouse, what we said to that family member, what we said in that relationship was not of God. That that maybe it wasn't what we said, maybe it's what we did. And what we did inside that relationship was not of God. That, That maybe we stepped out of that relationship and therefore what we did was not of God. And anytime we do that, it's called sin. And sin is anytime we're doing something opposite of what God desires. That, that when we do what is opposite of God, we sin. And this is what I know. Anytime we bring sin into a relationship, it destroys the relationship. So what we've got to do is fight to get sin out of the relationship so that it doesn't destroy it. You know, maybe I could say it this way. We need to get better in our relationships by doing what is best. And what is best is repenting of our wrongdoing and then doing what is right. And that's what I want to challenge us with today is to repent of our wrongdoing. Because if we don't, what it will do is destroy the relationship. And, and, and we see this. In a guy in the Bible. His name is Achan. For those who haven't been with us, we've been studying the book of Joshua. There's a guy named Joshua. He was a leader. He had thousands of of Israelites that were following him. And they were going into a time of war in the promised land. Achan was one of his soldiers. 
And, and Achan, what he did is he heard Joshua. Joshua said, guys, we're going to go fight this battle of Jericho. We talked about Jericho a couple times, but he said, we're going to fight this battle of Jericho. And the way we're going to win is we're going to march around the wall seven times. We're going to shout. We're going to blow our trumpets. The walls will fall down. We're going to go in and destroy everything. And when I say everything, destroy everything. Anything that was breathing, they were going to destroy. All right? It was a time of war 3,000 plus years ago. But then Joshua added one caveat to it. He said, destroy everything, but the plunder is not for you. The treasures are not for you. A normal time of war, you fight, you win, you plunder, you take it all back. But Joshua said, but, but the plunder, the treasures are God's. So you cannot take any for yourself. It all belongs to God. So all the men heard this. They marched around the city seven times. They blew their trumpets. They shout. The walls fell in. They rushed in. They destroyed everything. And they took all the gold, the silver, the plunder, the treasures back for God. Except for Achan. Achan did the opposite. Achan saw a beautiful robe that was from Babylon and he took it for his own possession. A Achan saw some silver. Achan saw some gold, and he took it as, as his own. And he took the silver and the gold and this robe, and he took it to his tent, his house, and he buried it under his tent, hoping nobody would know. Well, then a little bit of time passed, and they went towards their next battle. And on their next battle, it was against a little town called Ai, and uh, Joshua sent some spies to Ai, and as they got there, they noticed it was just a real small town, very few fighting men. They came back to Joshua and said, listen, just send a couple thousand troops. They're a small town, not very well fortified. This is going to be no big deal. So Joshua said, okay, and he sent 3,000 troops to Ai. But when they went and they battled Ai, this little town, Ai routed them destroyed them, killed 36 Israelites, which was a huge deal because they're used to not losing. And when I say not losing, not losing any men, not losing any life. They're used to God fighting on their side and everything being great, but they get routed, 36 people die, and they run in fear for their life back to Joshua. When they get to Joshua, they reported what was happening, and Joshua fell on his face, and he prayed. The prayer, it's a good thing that he prayed. What he prayed was a little off. Let me show you to it. Show you. It's Joshua chapter 7, verse 7. It reads like this. It says, Then Joshua cried out, cried out, O sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if you're only going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side. I want you to notice something here. I'm only going to talk about it for a second. It's really a sermon for a different day. But when tragedy hit, when trial hit, Joshua immediately asked, why are you doing this, God? Like, God, why did you bring us here? Why are you letting this happen? And I think that's exactly what we do oftentimes when trials hit, when tragedy hits. Our first question is, God, why are you doing this to me? And I know we say that out of a point of pain, but what we need to do is recognize that's not the best prayer. It wasn't God's fault. It was happening because of sin. It's the same thing today. When crap happens in our life, it happens because of sin. It could be your own sin, or it could be somebody else's sin. That sin is causing the destruction. It would have been better for Joshua to pray, not God, why are you doing this? But rather, God, what are you revealing to me in the midst of this? And I think that would be something for us all to learn. But again, that's a sermon for another day. Let me keep reading. After Joshua prayed that, he said this. Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and hidden the things among their own belongings. Well, like notice it here, it says that they have, they have sinned. And they've sinned, and he, they, he lists there's three ways that Achan sinned. That Achan stole some things, that he lied to me, and that he hidden things. That God is saying, Achan has stolen from me, he has lied to me, 
and he is hid from me. And if that's the case, it, it, it really brings me to just this thought today. How many of us are just like Achan? How many of us have robbed from God? How many of us have lied to God? How many of us have hid from God? Reality is, this is what I believe, there's a little bit of Achan in every one of us. Agree? I know there's a little bit of Achan in me. There's a lot of Achan in me at times. But there's a little bit of Achan in me, and there's a little bit of Achan in you, because we've all robbed from God. We've all lied to God. We've all hidden from God. And when we rob from God, lie to God, hide from God, it destroys our family. And you'll see that as you keep going through this passage. That, that, that Achan, he robbed from God. Literally, he took the gold, he took the silver, he took a robe that was for God, and he said, I'm going to take it for myself. It was supposed to have been returned to God but instead, he returned it and kept it to himself. And I think we do the same thing when it comes to giving to God. In, in the Bible, it's called a tithe. It means giving 10%. That, that God says, I've given you everything, all your finances, all your stuff. I've given it to you. And all I ask is that you return 10% to me. Yet statistically, statistically, the average is that 75% of people who attend the rock on a regular basis don't give back to God. So what that means is we're robbing from God. Uh, the prophet in the Old Testament, his name was Malachi, he said you rob from God when you don't give your tithe. So I, I think, one, that, that, that we're all guilty of robbing from God sometimes in that area. But there was another area that I want to hit more on. That he robbed from God's glory. That, that, that Achan took glory away from God. Because when they fought the battle of Jericho and they won, all the glory went to God. All the nations said, wow, their God fights for them. Until they went to Ai. And when they went to Ai, Ai won. So now everybody's saying, oh, the God of Ai, the false God of Ai, must be better than the God of the Israelites. So now all the neighboring towns, they're all thinking, well, if Ai's God can beat the Israelites' God, well, then so can ours. Because they lived in a very polytheistic society back then. So God's name, his glory, was stripped because Achan decided to live for himself. Maybe another way for me to say it is Achan decided to live for his name and his image and said, I'm going to take this stuff for me rather than living for the name and image of God. And I think the same thing happens in our families. Let's just make sure we catch this. When we sin, we don't only hurt the name of God, we hurt the name of our family. That your family name gets hurt. Your family image gets hurt because we rob and we steal from God, which causes us to rob and steal from our family. But, but let's go a step further. Look back at the verse. That it says that Israel's stolen. But it also says that Israel lied. That Israel lied. That, 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 that Achan lied. Now, the interesting thing about Achan here. Is, is he never verbally says a lie. Like, like, at least we don't have it recorded. That he never verbally says a lie with his lips. Yet, he lies with his life. His entire life was a lie. Because he said, I'm going to follow God, and I'm going to obey God, and I'm going to do what God says, and then I'm going to come and take the stuff for myself. That worse than telling a lie... He was living a lie. And how many times do we do that? How many times do we say, God, I'm all in, yet we're not? God, I'm going to obey what you have to say, but I don't. God, I'm going to honor my parents. I'm going to honor my spouse. I'm going to do all this, yet I don't. That will say, that will, will function as if, like, God, God, I'm going to surrender you. You're, you're my Savior. I'm a Christian, but my life looks nothing like Christ. 
Craig Groeschel, who's a pastor um, in, a, in a big church in Oklahoma, he says it this way, that we function like Christian atheists, that we'll call ourselves Christian, yet everything in our life denies God. And I think we do that with our, with our relationship with God. We do it with our relationship with our family. That we'll be like, yes, I'm married, but I look at that lady over there. Yes, I'm 100% committed. It's my wedding day till the day we die. I'm all in, and then we're not. That I'm all here for my family, but then I'm not. That, that will say, like, I love my wife. I love my spouse. I, I'm, I'm all in. Yet I keep thinking about the other side of the fence because the grass seems greener over there because there's this other girl or somebody's paying attention to me or whatever it is. Do you know why the grass is greener on the other side of the fence? That's where all the crap is. Crap makes the grass green. And when you look at the greener grass, realize there's probably crap that comes with that. So rather than going to the greener grass, stick to your family and work the soil so that your yard is good. <laughs> work it. Don't lie to your spouse, your family. Don't lie to God means I got to quit being like everybody else. I, I was listening to a sermon from a, a pastor up in Portland, and in it he quoted a guy who's a non-believer, not a Christian. And this is what the, the guy who's not a Christian said. His name's Ben Sixsmith. He said, I'm not religious, so it's not my place to dictate to Christians what they should and should not believe. But still, if someone has a faith worth following, I feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there is nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to be more like me. Because I think that's our problem is we're lying to ourselves, we're lying to our families, we're lying to God because we're not living the life that God has called us to live, which makes us look like everybody else. What would it look like if we said, God, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna steal from you anymore. God, I'm not gonna rob from you anymore. I'm, God, I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you anymore. And God, I'm not gonna hide from you anymore. When you go back to verse 11, that last part says that they've hidden some things. That they've hidden some things from me. And, and what had happened, literally Achan hid it. That he took the gold, he took the silver, he took the robe, and he buried it in his tent. And he thought, well, I can just hide this from God. God will never know. And my guess is he hid it from his family as well. We don't know. We, we don't see that part of the story, but my guess is, is that he was hiding it from his family as well, that he was living this lie and hiding everything from his family and from God because he thought, well, I can get away with it. Let me just make it real clear. You can't hide from God. You can't hide from him. You can't hide your stuff from God. Eventually, it'll come to the surface. Then, then you might think, well, well, I'll just hide my pornography from God. Like God won't find out. Uh, my spouse won't find out. I'll just hide it over here. It's my little secret. I'm not hurting anybody. It's just every now and then. It's not a big deal. Nobody will know. That, that I'm just going to hide the looks that I'm looking towards somebody every now and then. I mean, I'm not touching I'm not acting upon it. I'm, I'm just giving a look every now and then. Like nobody will ever know. That, that I'm just going to hide the fact from God and from my spouse. And I'm just, I'm having a conversation with that person. It's not a big deal. It's just their marriage is going through some difficulties. So I'm just trying to help them. And it's, it's nice to have an actual conversation because they're showing me more, more of themselves and, and, and talking with me more than my husband is anyway. So, but it's not really a big deal. And, and God... God won't know and my spouse won't know. It's not a big deal. We're not physically doing anything and we think we can hide it. It's just a little bit of 
a liquor at night. It's just a pill every now and then. I mean, they're not going to know about my addiction. I'm going to be able to keep it a secret. Achan thought he could hide. He couldn't. Adam and Eve thought they could hide. They couldn't. Adam sinned. He was ashamed. Felt naked. He went and hid behind a tree. God showed up and said, Adam, where are you at? Not because God had to ask. He was trying to get Adam to come clean. And it's the same thing with Achan. He didn't have to ask. He knew. But he needed the Achan to come clean. Because he was hiding. And it was destroying not just Achan and not just his immediate family, but 36 people's other families. That's what Achan's sin did. So, so God told Joshua, find him, find out who it was. So Joshua looked at the 12 tribes and narrowed it down to one tribe. And from that tribe, narrowed it down to a clan. And from that clan, named it, narrowed it down to a family. And the family, he recognized it was Achan. And he went to Achan, and I love the way he says it. He said, Achan, tell me. What is going on? It's verse 19. He says, Achan, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. And notice the three things are right there. Give glory, meaning don't rob God of his glory. Tell the truth. Stop lying. Don't hide it from me. So Achan, Achan fessed up. Achan, Achan shared with Joshua. He said, you're right. I've sinned. I've messed up. I took a robe. I took some gold. I took some silver. I hid it in my tent. So Joshua sent some men. They went to the tent. They found it. They brought it before him. And, and, and Achan he did confess, but the problem was, it was too late. He was caught, and his sin caused the death of others, and his confession, even in repentance, brought consequences. The next part of the story, the reality is what happened is they took Achan they took his family, they took his livestock, they took his tent, they took everything he owned, they put it in a valley, and they threw stones at him until he died, and everybody died. It was a form of capital punishment back then. And they did it because Achan sinned, and there had to be punishment for the sin. And I know right now you might be going, man, that, that sounds harsh. He, he confessed. He admitted it. Shouldn't he have gotten some grace? Well, he, what happened is he got the punishment that God's justice was met. Look, look at this verse. It says they piled, after this happened, they piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains to this day. That is why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. I, I want to teach you something about the justice and the grace of Jesus right now. That when we sin, there has to be punishment. That's called justice. And, and justice is something that we all want typically. We want things to be made right. Well, on that day, because of Achan's sin and because his sin killed others, there was justice. There was punishment. The, the people, they picked up the rocks and they threw the rocks at Achan until he was dead and justice was met. And then it says that God was no longer angry. And, and I know... What you might be thinking right now is, oh, okay, time out. So, Josh, you're telling me to repent like Achan, but Achan died, and I don't want to die. I get it. But see, here's the beauty. That just as Achan was punished and the sin was atoned for, that our sin has to be punished. 
And it was, and it was atoned for. But it's not atoned for through us. It's atoned for through Jesus Christ. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, he died upon that cross. And when he was on that cross, it might as well have been us riding on the rock. I've lied to you and then throwing a rock at Jesus. It might have been as well us riding on a rock that, that I've lied to you and throwing it at him. And the beauty is, though, that we are guilty of the sin. We are guilty of Jesus having to be on the cross. But because of what Jesus did, he took our pain. He took our punishment. He took our sins. And when we were hiding our sins from God, he was wearing them on the cross. Because they weren't hidden. He saw them plain as day. And because of the cross, the Father was no longer angry. Sin was paid for. So what I want to invite you to do today is first admit. Admit that you're a little like Achan. Admit that you've messed up. Admit that you've sinned just like I have. And come clean. And maybe today what you're going to do is you're going to walk up and you're going to grab a rock and grab one of the markers and write on that rock that I've been lying to you, God. Or maybe you're going to walk up and say, I've stolen from you. I've hid from you. got lust in my life or whatever else and then maybe as you do that you're going to repent and tell God you're sorry and take that sin and put it in the pile And walk away knowing God's not angry with you. God's never happy with our sin, but God's not angry with you. Because I've taken my sin and I've given it and I've placed it at the foot of the cross where Jesus bled and died and took the pain and took the punishment. So I want to invite you during this time of response to maybe just do that like many other people in our church have this weekend. Maybe for you it's writing it down, giving it to Jesus for the first time ever in your life and then saying from here, I'm getting baptized. I'm taking that step. I'm getting clean. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm all in. No more robbing, no more hiding, no more lying. I'm in. Maybe for you, it's going to the big rock and just putting your name on it, saying, I'm here to serve you, God. I don't know how you're going to respond today, but I'm going to invite you. Get better by doing what's best. And what's best is repenting and then doing what is right. Pray with me. Jesus, we come before you right now asking you right now, Jesus, to forgive us as we run to you. As we run to you as our Savior, as we run to you as our Lord, we quit hiding, we quit stealing, we quit lying, and we come to you in your name.